Welcome back to Hammer Unbox. Today, we're taking a closer look at memory scaling performance with Intel's new Outer Lake CPUs, or more specifically, the Core i9-12900K, though the results will apply quite broadly across the entire 12th gen range, particularly when CPU limited. Today's video is brought to you by Gigabyte and their range of laptops powered by NVIDIA RTX 30 series graphics. Whether you choose an Aorus laptop for high-end gaming or an Aero laptop for gaming and creating on the go, GeForce GPUs provide the performance you need. The Aero 15 line is a favourite of mine with its gorgeous 4K OLED display, but hardcore gamers will love the fast refresh rates on offer with Aorus laptops as well. Gigabyte's laptops come with GPUs from the RTX 3060 to the beastly RTX 3080 and are available in 15 and 17 inch sizes. Click the link in the description to learn more. Now, I've already taken a look at DDR4 3600 versus DDR5 6000 across 41 games and found that on average, the newer and much more expensive DDR5 memory was just 4% faster on average, though it was at times up around 20% faster in a few select titles. Both of the DDR4 and DDR5 memory used in that testing was very expensive, so today I want to compare a range of memory kits covering a wide range of price points, and all have been supplied by Corsair. The idea for this test wasn't to take a few premium kits and then manually adjust the timings and frequencies, which I have done in the past, but instead test memory kits you can actually buy. So I reached out to Corsair, submitted a long shopping list of kits that I'd like to include in the test, and they were gracious enough to help us out. So in total, we have nine 32 gigabyte memory kits from the Vengeance LPX, Vengeance RGB RT, Vengeance RGB Pro, and Dominator Platinum RGB series, covering DDR speeds from 2400 right up to 6200. The timings used are the default timings for each kit, and the primary timings are labeled on the graphs. I've simply loaded XMP on the MSI Z690 Tomahawk DDR4 and DDR5 motherboards using the latest BIOS. Though there are two instances where I did manually adjust the gear mode to show gear 1 and gear 2 performance when using DDR4 memory. The only other test system spec worth noting is the graphics card, and for all testing I have gone with the Radeon RX 6900 XT. So with that, let's jump into the results. First up, here's a look at memory bandwidth using the copy results from the A-64 memory test. Using the DDR4-2400 kit in its stock configuration, which defaults to the Gear 2 mode, we're looking at a throughput of just 33.35 gigabytes per second. Switching to gear one boosted that figure by 17%, but even here we're still limited to just shy of 40 gigabytes per second. DDR4 2933 offers a bit more performance as it increased bandwidth by almost 30%, while DDR4 3200 using slightly weaker timings only improved bandwidth by a further 2%. Beyond this point, the improvements for DDR4 are fairly minimal, and from 3,200 to 4,000, we're looking at a 15% increase. So certainly not nothing, but for a 25% increase in frequency, that's not a big jump. And this is due to the increased timings. I should also note that Corsair did provide a faster DDR4 memory kit, but it didn't work on our Z690 motherboard. So we maxed out at DDR4 4,000 with just shy of 60 gigabytes per second. This suggests to me that as usual when factoring in prices, CL16 DDR4 3600 to CL18 DDR4 3800 is probably going to make the most sense. Then from DDR4 4000 to DDR5 4800, we see a 16% increase in throughput and now we're at almost 70 gigabytes per second. Then from 4800 to 5200, we're looking at a 9% boost. And from 5200 to 5600, a 6% boost. And then finally an 11% boost to 6200 reaching an impressive 88 gigabytes per second transfer speed. But memory bandwidth isn't everything, and for a lot of workloads, memory latency is even more important, so let's take a look at that. Here we have the A to 64 DRAM latency data. Now, DRAM latency refers to the time delay between when a command is entered and when the data is available. So the best way to gauge a memory module's responsiveness is to measure latency in terms of nanoseconds. And that means that cast latency or CL timings are only part of the equation, so you can't just judge a memory's module's performance based on CL timings, which is why a lot of people have been confused by DDR5 and its seemingly high CL figures. Both memory speed, as in the frequency at which it operates, along with the CL timings or latency, play a critical role in system performance. As it stands right now, DDR5 hasn't achieved the frequencies or timings it needs to in order to beat most DDR4 modules in terms of latency, despite offering significantly more bandwidth. 
There's also the DRAM ratio to consider, which Intel now calls Gear 1, 2, and 4. In the Gear 1 mode, the memory controller operates at the same frequency as the DRAM, so a 1 to 1 ratio, while Gear 2 sees the memory controller operate at half the memory speed, and this greatly increases latency, but it also allows you to run the memory at a much higher frequency for increased bandwidth, which is what we see with DDR5. With DDR4 memory, you ideally want to use Gear 1 as you'd need to run the memory up around DDR5 speeds to offset the increased latency. With DDR4 2400, we're looking at a 40% increase in latency when switching from Gear 1 to Gear 2, and this will absolutely cripple performance in memory sensitive tasks, such as gaming. When it comes to DDR4 memory, we again see that the sweet spot is around the 3600 mark, with DDR4 4000 barely reducing latency from what we're seeing with the CL16 3600 kit. Then with DDR5, we see that despite the much higher operating frequency, latency doesn't improve over what we saw with DDR4, and this is because the Elder Lake memory controller can't run at a 1 to 1 ratio with the DRAM, forcing us to use Gear 2 mode for all DDR5 testing. Even at 6200 speeds, we're still looking at a latency of 63 nanoseconds, which is higher than even DDR4 3200CL16. So for now, DDR5 will thrive in applications and games that require big memory bandwidths and aren't as sensitive to latency. That said, a lot of applications are both memory latency and bandwidth sensitive, such as Corona. So if you have weak memory bandwidth coupled with weak latency performance, performance overall is going to tank, and we see that with the DDR4 2400 kit using the Gear 2 mode, which was the default setting for this configuration. However, the rest of the memory kits either offer strong bandwidth performance or respectable latency, and we're looking at no more than 11% difference between the fastest and slowest kits. DDR4 4000 CL18 using Gear 1 did provide the best results, but DDR4 3200 and 3600 CL16 also beat out all of the DDR5 kits. Interestingly, Adobe Photoshop is more sensitive to memory bandwidth, and this benefited the DDR5 memory kits as they produced the best results. That said, DDR4 3600 and 3200CL16 wasn't a great deal slower than most of the DDR5 kits, but if you're after maximum performance in this application, the faster DDR5 memory will be better. Okay, so time for some games, and we'll start with Rainbow Six Siege using the ultra quality preset at 1080p with the Radeon RX 6900 XT. Quite interestingly, the 1200K can drive over 500 FPS using DDR4 2400 memory in the Gear 2 mode, and that meant the best DDR4 results, which was still with DDR4 3200 memory, was just 9% faster when comparing the average frame rate, or 14% faster for the 1% lows. DDR4 4000 memory allowed for a similar average frame rate, but the increased latency did reduce the 1% lows. And then DDR5, on the other hand, managed to push forward for the average frame rate, but did need to be running at 6200 speeds before it could exceed the 1% lows of the higher quality DDR4 memory. Interestingly, by increasing the resolution to 1440p, things did change around quite a bit, though overall the margins are now smaller as we become more GPU limited. Still, we see that DDR5 5200 and up now offers the best 1% low performance coupled with the highest average frame rates, even if DDR5 6200 is only 3% faster than DDR4 3200. Horizon Zero Dawn has been tested using the slightly dialed down favor quality preset, and we'll again start with the 1080p data. For the most part, we appear fairly GPU limited here, and that's going to be the case for 1200k owners in the vast majority of games, even with an extreme GPU. Once we hit DDR4 2933CL16, we're pretty close to maxing out what can be achieved here. The higher clock DDR5 memory does offer a small performance improvement, but we're talking about at most a 4% boost over DDR4 3600. Moving to 1440p further reduces the already small margins, and now anything above DDR4 3200 is basically providing the same level of performance here. Shut off the Tomb Raider is very CPU intensive. But again, at 1080p with the 1600 XT, we're able to turn the game from CPU limited to GPU limited by the time we reach DDR4 2933CL16. But we do see small improvements as memory performance is increased, but from 2933 to 6200, we're looking at a 7% increase in 1% lows. That's it. So that being the case, moving to 1440p neutralizes the test results with the exception of the Gear 2 mode for DDR4 2400, which dropped the average frame rate by 13%.
Cyberpunk 2077 was tested using the medium quality preset and at 1080p we do see a reasonably large performance difference between the various memory configurations. The DDR4 2400 geared 2 configuration completely broke performance as simply switching to gear 1 boosted the average frame rate by a massive 41%. Then from 2400 to 2933, we see a further 12% increase. And at that point, DDR4 is pretty well maxed out with 3200, 3600, and even 4000 only offering a few extra frames. DDR5 does move performance along a little bit though. DDR5 4800 was 4% faster than DDR4 4000. And we continue to see around a 3 to 4% gain with each step up to DDR5 6200, hitting 178 FPS on average. In the end, that meant DDR5 6200 was 13% faster than DDR4 4000. Jumping to 1440p starts to introduce a GPU bottleneck, but interestingly, the increased bandwidth of DDR5 does help to boost performance here, and going from DDR4 4000 to DDR5 4800 increased the average frame rate by 5%, while having next to no impact on 1% lows. Finally, we have Hitman 3, and at 1080p, it's again really only the DDR4 2400 Gear 2 configuration that noticeably drops off the pace. Switching to Gear 1 increased the frame rates by 16%, and from there, DDR4 peaked with the 3600 kit, which was a mere 5% faster than the 2400 kit using Gear 1. DDR5 again didn't do much to improve 1% lows, but the average frame rate was increased by 5%, even with the 4800 spec kit. Increasing the resolution of 1440p, where we're still pushing over 200 FPS for the most part, the Core i9-12900K was pretty well maxed out using DDR4 2933. Of course, we do see a 7% increase in 1% lows from DDR4 2933 to DDR5 6200, but that's really a negligible difference given the massive increase in bandwidth DDR5 offers. Okay, so we've taken a good look at performance using a wide range of DDR4 and DDR5 memory kits, with the Core i9-12900K. Now the question is, what should you buy? I think the best way to answer that question, or the first step in answering that question is to look at pricing. So let's go do that. Although I tested with DDR4 2400 and 2933 memory, we might as well delete those kits from the pricing data, given that they cost more than DDR4 3200 and even 3600 in some instances. So pricing really starts at around $100 for a 32 gigabyte kit of DDR4 3200 cell 16 memory, and the Corsair Vengeance LPX memory that I used costs $115. Then for DDR4 3600, the LPX stuff comes in at $140, with the Vengeance RGB RT stuff that I used priced at $150. Though do note for similar spec memory pricing starts at $120. Then we have DDR4 4000, which for the most part wasn't really any faster than the 3600 kit, and from Corsair you're looking at a starting price of $200. Though there are similarly spec kits such as the G-Skill Ripjaws V-Series for just $135, and frankly that memory is extremely difficult to beat at that price. So the sweet spot for DDR4 memory is around the 3600 to 4000 range depending on pricing in your region. Basically for gamers, DDR4 3200CL16 and up pretty well got the most out of the Core i9-12900K when CPU limited, so make your purchase with that information in mind. Really, for anyone looking to maximize the value of an Elder Lake processor, DDR4 memory is what you'll be after, and there really isn't any point, as far as I can tell, going beyond DDR4 4000. So basically, if DDR4 3200 CL16 and DDR4 4000 CL18 were priced fairly similarly in your region, then you might as well just go with the 4000 stuff. As for DDR5, there's really little point investing in it right now unless you simply want the best of the best, at which point you're going for the 6000 spec memory, which costs roughly the same amount as the 12900K processor. So I see little reason to go with the more affordable 4800 to 5600 memory if you're just gaming, especially given you're probably going to be GPU limited more often than not. For productivity workloads where time is money, you may be able to justify the cost of premium high-end DDR5, but you'll also want to make sure that the 12900K is the fastest processor for that workload, otherwise something like the Ryzen 9 5950X or Threadripper CPUs may be a better investment. Anyway, that is going to do it for this look at memory scaling performance with the 12900K, and I suppose Elder Lake in general. If you enjoyed the video, then please do give it a like, subscribe for more content, and if you'd like to become a Harbor and Box community member, which gets you some pretty cool perks, you can sign up at Floatplane or Patreon. It'll give you access to our exclusive Discord server, great place to hang out and chat, 
uh, live streams where you can chat with Tim and myself live, ask questions live, have us answer those questions live. It's all very live. And uh, we also have behind the scenes content, Q and A's. So a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, check out Float Plan or Patreon. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.